I had a talk prepared and I will get on with that a little bit, but I think it's important that I briefly pause and respond to Jeff Jarvis, who was uh, here just a few minutes. I think he's left now, so that's a little unfortunate, but there's a lot of what Jeff said that I agree with, but I have a huge concern with the way education is being framed. In fact, I take it one step further and say the problem of education does not concern me quite as much as the solutions to the problem of education are starting to concern me. <laughs> education is not about building better Googlers. Education is not about building better corporate citizens, better employees for organization. Education has, in the words of Edgar Morin, one vital task to prepare individuals for the vital combat for lucidity. To prepare individuals to be a part of society. To prepare individuals to contribute, to create, to share, to interact. It is not to serve the corporate spectrum the way that education is regrettably being phrased today. And I'll take it one step further and say, if our future model of education needs to draw heavily from corporations, I don't want any part of it. The reason being that <laughs> when we think about education, we need systems that permit optimal capacity for connections. Corporate-like structures are not created for optimal capacity for connections. They're created for a very focused, laser-like target to some very valid aspects. But if we build our educational system on a corporate system, we end up with a one-legged stool that serves absolutely no practical purpose. So I just want to draw, put that out as a starting point because in my view, teaching is the beautiful profession. Teaching is of far greater value to society than it's often given credit for. The development of next generation, the development of mindsets and attitudes, the changing of individual lives. I mean, that's the intent, the goal, and the focus of education. And so I'm a little concerned when we reduce it to the wrong point of focus. So I want to talk today about collapsing two connections and what I mean with that. I'll give you a little bit of background. I was born in Mexico in a small town just south of the El Paso Juarez border. We didn't have electricity. We, our community, did not have paved roads. We didn't have any type of technology other than tractors, but because tractors were too worldly, we couldn't put rubber tires on the tractors. So we could deal with our guilt by just having steel tires, which in case you know they're really hard to blow up, but you never get a flat, right? So that's a positive. <laughs> but this was the mindset, this was the constrained mode of thinking. But there was a positive in this experience for me. I learned to think about the world in a small, clustered social system. I remember sitting at the corner of a room when you would have adults, friends over of my parents, and they would have a kerosene lamp be placed on the center of the table. Kids would be off in a corner somewhere. You'd have sawdust on the floor uh, to catch any spills or stains or whatever else. And the conversation seemed to move almost rhythmically with the flames flickering on the wall. And I have that sense, that kerosene smell still embedded in my mind. And when I encounter it, it's immediately I'm transported back to that kind of environment or that kind of an experience because there was something beautiful about that space. There was a sense of, I am a part. I'm socially developing my identity. But there was something very disconcerting about that experience because the information that was flowing through those systems was inherently not true on many levels. Because individuals in the community had the capacity to define which connections were suitable and which connections were not. So, for example, if you suffered from a physical ailment, you could go and reach out to the worldly doctors, the overeducated people, and they would help you with your physical ailment. But you could not draw the connection and say, if you had a mental illness, if you suffered from depression or anxiety. No, 
that connection could not be drawn to health. That connection could only be drawn to the spiritual realm of demons. So in one sense, this community that provided a very rich, soft social space in which to come to know and to trust and to learn to relate to others well had a downside in that its information distribution structures were closed, they were isolated, and unfortunately they largely omitted the capacity of individuals to create and to innovate. I still recall the experiences as a young child of, well, I mean, I'm probably going to be the first TED Talk speaker to ever say outhouse. But uh, obviously you don't have plumbing. So if you were one of the people who's been afraid as a, as a child to go downstairs to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night because the demons that lurked in the basement, try doing that in absolute blackness with not a single street lamp when you've got an outhouse that's about 200 miles away. Uh, there should be a lot more sprinters coming out of that part of the world would be my view. But the, uh, the system, the, the, the system that I was a part of and the possible range of social connections that were being formed for me were extremely valuable. When I came to Canada, the proud holder of the 2010 Men's and Women's Olympic Gold Hockey Medals. When I came to Canada, uh, sorry, I had a slight detour there, I entered an education system that did something else well. It had a better emphasis on the information exchange, the information validation based on things called the scientific method. We were able to, and really, what is science other than drawing appropriate connections? It's about saying, H1N1 is not caused by the spirits. There is a biological underlying cause for this. So the scientific method is really a structured method whereby which we challenge the value of the connections that we form between different entities. But came to Canada, started attending the school system. What was missing though, those soft social experiences that permit you to feel a sense of oneness and identity that you have in these, these small social settings were gone, but instead there was a process of rigid information interrogation, which in itself was very valuable. So we shifted in the educational system, for me at least, I exchanged my social identity for information value. And there's a strong sense in which the internet as we see it today is a binding back of information to our social roots. Tools such as, and it's the functionality I'm interested in, not the tool itself, but tools such as Ning, Twitter, Facebook, they enable us to create authentic information interrogation systems and offer a social overlay that simply wasn't possible in those kinds of contexts, at least when I first started attending the school system. But technology has a way, and this is my view, technology is philosophy. Technology is ideology. When someone sits down and designs a tool like Blackboard, they are telling me what permissions and what freedoms I have and don't have. The very same battles that we've fought, the, the pursuit of democracy, the pursuit of an open society, the pursuit of information dissemination, those very same battles are being repurposed in a digital space. If you take some time to read to Tocqueville and you gain a sense of localized government and the value of localized government, then you have a strong sense of the value of customization of learning resources within particular settings. So in many ways, we are renegotiating the parameters by which our society will function democratically based on the software tools that are being made available to us. In many cases, I think we're making a choice at times where we're willing to accept the convenience of a tool, the low cost or no cost of a tool, in exchange for freedom of cost. And I think that's a negative uh, approach, essentially, that we're taking. When we start to consider, for example, the school systems as we have it today, as they're beginning to evolve with technology, we're starting to have the best of the worst of worlds. What I mean with that, the clustered social system that I had in my youth can be created through technologies in classroom environments, but they're often locked down and closed off, so they can't be created. The systems for information exchange and information interaction, similarly, are being reduced and closed down and locked down. So now we have a system where the information interrogation system, the critical skills that our students need to know in the vital combat for lucidity, those systems are being reduced and being controlled and locked down. And so we have a point where our individual learners and our social structures are no longer effectively serving the needs of individuals. 
How many of you have seen the movie A Private Universe, or at least the short documentary? Let me tell you about it. <laughs> uh, Private Universe was a program that visited a group of Harvard graduates. They asked them, why do we have seasons? 21 out of 23 graduates, alumni, and faculty were not capable of providing the answer to why we have seasons. These are Harvard graduates. This was done on the day of graduation. There's something missing here. There is a sense in which connectedness has gone awry. People have connected because we are by nature connection-forming beings. Social, conceptual, relational connections. It's ongoing, it's continual. But when we don't express, when we don't subject our thinking and our ideas to a network structure, what ends up happening is we have an information failure where we can labor under incorrect assumption for a long period of time, which is one of the reasons why I strongly advocate for learning in transparent means. When we learn transparently, we become teachers. The act of showing others how we're learning is an instructional task. In the same regard, every expression is an opportunity for connection in a digital space. Every tweet, every blog post, every podcast, these are all opportunities for connections and for future uh, interaction around those connections. The Economist just has a recent post out, which I think brings to the forefront the vital challenge society faces, which is, and it's called Data Deluge. And it's addressing the fact that, as we've seen with numerous incidents, whether it was 9-11, whether it was with the market meltdown of 2008, whether it relates to the uh, spread of, of diseases or natural calamities, in most instances, there are enough foreshadowing points of information that we could have spotted and done something about it. The critical problem was one of connectedness. We were not bringing the connections together. And I emphasize, I'll say very directly, our focus in education should be to collapse to the point of a connection, uh, to sense make around social and technological connections. I, I don't emphasize networks as much because networks are really a high level abstraction. Networks are a pattern structure. There are ways of representing what's happening. What we need to do educationally, in my opinion, is to reduce the process of the education system down to connectedness, because each of us has control at that level. We don't have control necessarily at a broad network spectrum level, but at an individual connection, one student relating to another student, we have control. Or, if we take it a different perspective, if we can, through effective data and information mining, be able to understand how my interaction with you resulted in a conceptual advancement on my part, that starts to become very valuable. The network, it's incidental in my eyes. It's the connection that's critical. The social and technological connections, for that matter, that are most vital. And I want to talk a little bit about an illustration of a course that I've run in 2008, 2009, and will be running in fall again with Stephen Downs. It was the Connectivism and Connective Knowledge course. And we structured it in such a way to say we want to disrupt the notion of what it means to be a teacher. We want to disrupt what it means to be a learner. So what we did, we designed a course where we challenged the assumptions that we had about place-based views of education. So we said, you don't have to come to our space. You don't have to come to our LMS. Uh, you don't even have to write in blog services that we provide. We're going to start off with a reading list each week. We'll have some synchronous discussions. But other than that, we want you to blog, to tweet, to do whatever it is that you want in any format that you want. Uh, we want learners to experience what information overload means because no one knows everything. In fact, some of the things such as SARS and H1N1, uh, these cannot be solved by an individual. They can only be solved by a network. That's the only way in which we can solve some of the big health problems or even issues like global warming. We have to distribute our cognition and connect it in such a manner that allows us to address and to meet the needs of these individual problems or challenges that we face. School reform is no different. We have to take the same lessons that we want our students to learn and apply it to how we think about and how we want to rewrite the school system and what it means. But the difficulty is, and this is the first thing we encountered with our course, was media fragments understanding. The coherent narrative that an educator produces in a classroom is fragmented when you begin to move it into alternative media environments. But the irony, in order to understand a discipline well, we need 
a coherent framework. We need a connected structure by which to interpret and understand and assess what we're experiencing. So on the one hand, media disrupts traditional teaching, but simultaneously also disrupts the narrative of coherence that we need in order to understand and to relate well to a particular subject. So how do you tie that together again? How do you weave together a narrative of coherence that permits individual students, that permits educators to be able to relate well? Put another way, how do you create a centralized outcome through a decentralized distributed process? I mean, that's really the key challenge we have educationally, because we know we're going to fragment the educational process on many, many levels. It's how do we pull it back together? Fragmentation is the easy part. The internet demonstrated we can easily blow things up. But how do you tie them back together in such a way that leads to advanced conceptual understanding so we don't have a private universe phenomenon where we have conceptually inappropriate views of the world and what the world means? Keep in mind, science is a system of forming appropriate connections. So in an educational process, we similarly need to experiment with how do we reduce these things? How do we reduce the educational process to a unit of change we can all control? How do we collapse it to a point of connections? There's a course that Dave Cormier and I will be running in uh, early April, which looks at future trends in education and technology, which will be an open course as well. And our intent, again, is simultaneously to ask those kinds of questions. Let's fragment everything, and then let's find a way that we can piece it together in such a way, because uh, in such a way that can be understood in a meaningful way for individual educators, because those same skills are the ones that educators need to model when they present it to uh, their students. Now, on many levels, the challenges that society faces center around an education concern. The ability to create people of ethical character are an educational concern. And in fact, we drop so much on the education process, it's amazing that it functions as well as it does. If we have a problem with teenage behavior, that's an educational problem. If we have some other country that's doing a really good job with math scores, well, we don't have that, okay, that's our educational problem. So education is the first whipping post for everything that goes wrong within the societal structure. And so when we come along and then we have Web 2.0 and social media technologies, we grasp at these things because our need as teachers is so great to have a sense of control, to have a sense of being able to influence because we've been powerless for such a long uh, period of time. So I want to emphasize, as a concluding thought, my view is that the primary task of education in the future is to collapse its functions, its curriculum, its teaching methods, its very mode of inquiry down to the point of connectedness. Why do connections form? What patterns do they leave when they form? What's the ultimate impact of that? How do we foster that as educators? How do we create structures that permit individuals to not be better corporate citizens, but how do we create that so that we have students and learners that leave our class spaces who are better citizens, who are better members of society? Because to change education, is to change society.